we're talking about quantum physics. Now, I don't know whether you uh, know a whole lot about this or not. I don't, but it is very interesting, and she studied some things on She has a book called Quantum Faith, and uh, when you get into this, it, it sounds like things that Jesus was teaching, <laughs> and I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, let's talk about on, on today's broadcast uh, the frequency and, and vibration uh, and, and how it relates to things. Well, all things that we see actually have a frequency and a vibration to them. Now, this, this table and this floor, they don't look like they're moving to me, but that's simply because our eyes cannot catch the movement. But when you get to the subatomic level, there are movements that are going on which causes a frequency or a vibration. So this table is vibrating. We, the human body actually has a vibration that can be measured. Hmm. Everything has a vibration. There's nothing really totally solid. Everything has a movement and vibration. Well, that interested me because our words also have a vibration and a frequency to them. Right. And the Bible says that in the beginning that God spoke the worlds into existence. So he used the energy vibration of his words to create and to release. He said, light be and light was. Now, where did light come from? He called it out of darkness. He called it out of nothing. <laughs> he called it out of darkness. But he spoke. Now, a lot of people seem to think that uh, I have friends that talk to me and they say, oh, well, science and the Bible disagree and that they have nothing in common. They're on opposite ends. But really, I don't believe that's so. Because when you talk about the universe exploding into being, well, if God said light be and light was suddenly created, what do you think would happen? There'd be a big explosion, <laughs> wouldn't there? Yes. And the worlds, everything that was made was made out of things that we cannot see. We've got hydrogen and helium and these gases, you know, and they eventually, they were moving, they were rapid, they were hot. And as they slowed, they solidified. And when they solidified, then you have planets, you have all these uh, heavenly bodies. And if you look at water, when the molecules in the water is heated, like when you put it in a microwave oven and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, then it's the electrons, they're all excited, they're moving faster, it produces heat. But when you slow that down, and you slow it down until it reaches 32 degrees, then it freezes and it becomes solid. And you say, well, where did you get that ice? <laughs> Where did you get the ice? Well, we got it from hydrogen, and we got it from oxygen, and you can't see either one of those. But when you combine the two, and you have two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, it becomes water. Then that's something you can see. And you change the form of it by lowering the frequency, and it becomes solid. And in the same way that God called creation out of nothingness into something, we can, by our faith, call the things we need in this life out of seeming nothingness, out of the realm of all, <clears throat> excuse me, all possibilities. Well, uh, and, and the promises, see, uh, faith gives substance to things hoped for. What is it we hope for? We hope for the thing God has given us, His promises. Uh, but hope won't get it. You, you, faith is what causes manifestation. You give substance to it. Now, now listen to what the Scripture says in Hebrews 11, 3. It says, Through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And that's what you were talking about on the last broadcast, the fact that these... Uh, what do they call them? Uh, Quirks, uh, subatomic uh, particles. Subatomic particles, <laughs> electrons. <laughs> they, they, you can't see them. They exist in a gas state until you begin to uh, search for them. Then they appear. Uh, and God created the world with things that do not appear. So it, <laughs> it sounds just like that science is tapping into some of God's laws, that, that yeah. it's confusing them to a degree. They don't well, that's really why the understand it. Right. All. That's why the Bible has not been believable to people who are of a scientific mind, because after all, you know, uh, you can't make something out of nothing, they believe. 
You can't speak to a mountain and see it removed. A man can't walk on water. A person can't heal the sick. You know, uh, uh, Jesus couldn't have ascended into heaven. But when you get into the realm of quantum physics, there's a huge realm of all possibilities. And it is determined, what you see is determined by the observer. So if Jesus believed and knew laws that we know nothing about, he obviously tapped into them. And then he said, the works that I do, greater works than these will you do. So I believe that we are expected to take these laws that are in the Bible that science has said, well, that's senseless, it's religion. And now they're looking at the subatomic realm and they're going, this couldn't happen. You can't, you've got to be able to prove that this happens, this happens, and this happens. But no, when you get into the subatomic realm, nothing happens apart from the observer. Hmm. That's Nothing interesting. happens. Now, uh, I remember, I may get, be getting ahead of it, but I remember you talking about uh, some experiment that was done uh, where they shot this particle of, particle light, of something, proton, through a box and through a lead plate. And uh, uh, relate that to it. I thought that was very interesting. Well, there were two very interesting uh, experiments that they did that still has everyone shaking their head. The first one is it's called the double slit experiment. And they released a shot of photon, and they would have a screen here that had one slit in it. And when they shot the photon, and it went through the, the one slit, then they would find a spot, the particle or the spot, on a certain place on a, like a screen, like an x-ray film type thing at the back. So then they thought, well, let's put two slits here. So they put two slits there. And when they put two slits there, they had a totally different experience. Now, the interesting part was, when you look at it, you can just see waves. There's dark spot, light spot, dark spot when the two slits are open. When there's only one slit open, it lands in a little splat right here or a little particle. So they kept repeating this experiment. And the interesting thing was, you have a single photon, and it goes through one slit or the other, OK? The question is, if there's only one, how does it know that there are two slits open or only one? Because it behaves differently when there are two slits open. <laughs> so actually, there are some physicists who believe that that exhibits some sort of consciousness or awareness. Now, the second experiment they did was even more fascinating to me. And they did this similar double slit experiment, but they had a little screen that they would flip up or down. In other words, they would, before they shot it, uh, they usually would flip the screen up or lay the screen down. And they would get different results. Well, they decided to do something very strange. They released the photon, shot it out there, and before it hit the photographic plate, they raised the screen up to sort of fool it, I guess. But the fact of the matter was, it knew the screen went up, and so it behaved as it, as it should when the screen went up as it would pass through it, even though it didn't pass through it. Hmm. So it exhibited this the particles that even on the, the subatomic level, that they react to what we're doing. They react to what we believe. They react to our actions and what we're doing. And this brings us back to the fact that things respond to us. They respond to our words. Uh, Jesus said in Luke uh, 17 and verse 6, the scripture says, So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed. Now the mustard seed was the smallest reference that Jesus could give because it was so tiny. Today, Jesus might say, if you had faith as a quark, which is a subatomic particle, yeah. or faith as an electron, he said, if you just had faith as a little bitty, tiny atomic structure, he said, if you had faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. It yeah. would obey you. Things respond to us. Now, yes, they do on the subatomic level. But imagine, everything's made up of atoms and of particles. Mm -hmm. So if you have a car, 
and you speak to that car, that car's going to respond to you. If you say, this is the worst car I've ever had, this is the biggest junk heap I've ever had, it won't run, then guess what? That car is listening to you down to the subatomic realm, and it's going to respond by not running, by having problems. Yeah, you hear what most people say. They go out there in cold morning, they hit the starter, and it goes, Rrr. That's the way you do. Every time I'm in a hurry, you won't start. Uh, they're calling things that are as though they are, and they'll stay like they are, you yeah. know. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, what it responds to, to the belief. And uh, there's a power of believing the placebo effect proves that, yes. that it changes situations and real circumstances, and, and you don't know how. I mean, it's, it gets over into this other realm. Uh, I remember Brother Copeland telling a story one time about when he and Gloria was going to a meeting, had an old Riviera that was driving, and, and he was fussing about it. He said, Gloria, this old uh, car's going to fall apart before we get it paid for. <laughs> he said, hey, what about three blocks down the street? The drunk were on a stoplight and scattered it all over the street. <laughs> and the Lord said, now are you happy with this, what you said? <laughs> <laughs> but people don't realize the power of words once you go to believing. Now, the reason some people don't believe it, they don't have any faith in their words. They just talk all kinds of foolishness, tickle me to death, laugh, the thought of die, die, to go, go and die if I don't. So they don't release faith in their words, but yet still what they're saying will cause them to err uh, in things that they do. Because they say, if I ever get under pressure, I always make a wrong decision. Mm -hmm. Uh, as long as they say that, they will do that. That's right. And when Jesus said, you can say to this tree, be removed, be plucked up, be planted in the sea, it would obey you. Everything really obeys you, whether you believe it or not, with the exception of your children. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> things do obey you. And actually, your children will, because if you tell your children, and continually tell them they're no good, they won't amount to anything, then they will respond to that unless they have the ability through the Holy Spirit to rise up above it. But when Jesus was speaking to this tree, he was giving a demonstration. And he, if he just said this once, you might think, well, you know, maybe there's a misinterpretation here. But Jesus said the mountain would move. Jesus spoke to the winds and the waves. He spoke to things, and things obeyed him. Now, his words and our words are frequencies. Now, you probably have a lower uh, frequency as far as you're speaking. Your voice is lower. It sounds different than mine. Mine sounds higher. But that shows you there are frequencies to words. And when you release your words, you're releasing frequencies that affect things the unseen and the seen realm. Do you remember when you were growing up, we lived out north of England there, uh, that tree that Peggy planted in the yard out there, and, and it was a sycamore tree, and, and I said, I'm going to pour diesel oil around that tree. I'm going to kill that tree. That tree's not going to live in my yard. I hated those big leaves because we had to rake them. We had two in our yard when I was growing up. And, and I bad mount that tree every time I went by it. That tree got 20 feet high, and one day it died. And, and I came in, and she said, you poured diesel around that tree. I said, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. I killed a thing with my words. And that's before I even got a hold of the faith message. Yes. But I, I talked bad about that tree every time I went around it. The tree died. Well, and not only did you speak the words, you pictured yourself pouring diesel yeah, fuel yeah. around it. And so you produced a toxic atmosphere. The possibility, and it... And it it killed the tree. Yeah. And of course, <laughs> of course, now they've done experiments and they know that plants respond to us. The people that talk to their plants, you know, oh, you're a beautiful plant. You know, I love you. Your flowers are beautiful. Those will grow and prosper and they will change and just continue to grow. And the ones that are ignored and the ones that are spoken uh, evil to, they also respond, but they can actually see. They have a way of photographing. They can see the leaves start to just wither. There was actually an experiment one time that was done. 
there was a man that uh, came in uh, where they were performing an experiment with plants, and he absolutely hated a certain kind of plant. And so they set a camera up on this plant that could measure very small movements and things like that. And this man, every time he would walk in, this plant would actually begin to pull up and draw away because it responded to his dislike. And yet there were others that would come in that loved the plant that would talk into it and they could see that it would just almost, almost relax and begin to flower out. Now this wasn't a big thing, but this was very tiny microscopic. But that shows you how in the, when you talk about quantum physics and you talk about faith, that on an atomic level, things respond to us. So if you want something out of your life, then you take your attention off of it, you tell it to leave, and you take your attention off of it. Mm -hmm. Here's where a lot of people miss it. I know someone right now that they want out of debt more than anything in their life. You know, they really want out of debt, so they're working to get out of debt. The problem is they have become more focused on the debt mm -hmm. than they have on prosperity. You see, you can't focus on and talk about debt and have prosperity, or you can't focus on uh, sickness and talk about sickness all the time and have health, because right. whatever you focus your attention on, whatever you observe, gets bigger in your life and responds. So you right. want to make sure you're focused on the Word of God. You the want answer. to make sure, yeah, the, the answer, answer the, the promise. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God is quick, it is powerful, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, when you analyze that in a scientific manner, the Word of God is quick. How fast is quick? <laughs> is the speed of light quick? I'd say so. If you take the light of God's Word and a light travels at 186,272 miles per second and God's Word is quick, God's Word I believe travels at the speed of light because that's where God is, it is the most powerful force. And when you take that and you speak that Word, you're taking that frequency and introducing it into a situation that will pluck a tree up, that will move a mountain, will, that will change the circumstances of your life. Interesting story a fellow told me one time. He said, I heard you and Brother Copeland talking about speaking to the sycamine tree and it would obey you preaching from uh, Luke 17. And he said, there was a tree on our line between our lot and the next neighbor's lot and said, I want to cut it down because it had big leaves on it, but said, knew the neighbor would have a problem with that. So every time I'd get out of the car, I'd just point out and say, be plucked up by the roots. He said, well, he wasn't in a sea close, so he didn't say he was put it in the sea. But he said, this went on for months, and his wife would just roll her eyes and shake her head, thought he'd gone berserk, you know. And after about three months, one night, there was a thunderstorm. They got up the next morning, that tree, the roots and all, was laying in his yard. <laughs> and he said, the amazing thing about it, lawn furniture, wooden lawn furniture, sitting out in the yard, was not even turned over. One tree plucked up with the roots. The now, he said, that'll it. jerk the slack out of your chain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's always amazing to me that people are surprised that they get what they say. Yeah. Because God said that's the way it works. And you know, what we're talking about is a, is a law of God. It's a law called, or a principle called, calling things that are not. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's what 1 Corinthians said, you know. God has chosen things that are not. Not what? Not manifest. To bring to naught things that are manifest. In other words, you talk to the mountain, you, you don't talk about it, you speak to it, the problem area, the situation, and tell it what to do. Uh, release it faith in, uh, in the Abraham's life, or Abram's life, you know. God couldn't get Abram to say what God said about him. But finally, he changed his name to Abraham and forced him to say what God said about it. He had to promise 24 years, no manifestation of it. But after he started saying what God said, the promised child was born in, in less than a year. Calling things or not. And that's what it says in, in the, the fourth chapter of Romans. That God told Abraham to call things that were not. That were not. And see, and when you are in quantum physics, and they talk about that wave particle state. 
that in that wave state, they don't even know if anything really exists there until somebody looks at it. So until Abram began to say Abraham, he wasn't observing the promise of God. That's right. And, and you know, uh, when, when I was thinking about that and talking about it a lot of times and teach on it just about everywhere I go, uh, you realize that when you take the promise of God, the word of promise, and put it in your mouth. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 10, the word is nigh you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. It's first in your mouth, then it gets in your heart. In other words, you speak it there. It becomes a seed, and, and you speak it in the heart. And it's talking about the core, the center of your being, not the blood pump. But he it says it's in your mouth and in your heart. So when you give voice to God's Word, that may be the only voice of God you'll ever hear, audible voice of God you'll ever hear. But it functions in this realm that is beyond what the world knows about it. And, and it, it gets over into this quantum physics and things that, uh, where it works different than most people think, you know. Well, I think that's what's happening with uh, quantum physics is they're just discovering what is already told in the Bible. It's just written in a different type of the language. Mm -hmm. And what you believe affects the unseen realm. It affects it, and it brings substance, your faith, is the substance of what is hoped for. So when you speak that, those words which are energy and frequency, and it is a carrier, your words are carriers. They're either carriers of faith or carriers of the frequency of fear. Yeah. And we know what happens when, you're, when you enter into the frequency of fear. I mean, after all, Peter sank. Yeah. But when your words are the carriers of that faith, Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had promised, God was able to perform. And when we're, we're fully persuaded and we speak God's word, we are changing the things in our life. We are calling things that are not into the realm of the seen, from the realm of the unseen. It's, it's the law of change. Is the law of faith is a law of change. You, you call things that are not as though they were until they are. And, and that's why Paul said the carnal mind is enmity against God, not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In other words, you can't, you, you can't give this by mental assent. You have to get it on the inside of you and confess the Word till it changes you on the inside, and you begin to see things in a different light. Right. Uh, you see the thing removed. Actually, God told Abram, He said, I'm going to give you everything you can see. And that was a physical land back then. Today, our promised land, the promise is a new covenant, and, and he'll still give you everything you can see. If you can see it in here and get it on the inside of you, words create images. Until you can see it on the inside, you'll be led by your spirit to live it out on the outside because you'll be, uh, your spirit, the human spirit, will contact God's spirit, and you'll be led by your spirit to be in the right place at the right time to meet the right people for the right situation. And, and it takes the struggle out of faith. You hear so many people say, I'm just trying to have faith. You don't have faith by trying. You confess the Word until that Word gets on the inside of you, then it radiates from you and it creates images. Words create images. Absolutely. I remember several years ago when I believed God wanted me to have an airplane to fly all over the United States and do meetings, and I began to call that airplane in. I called it to me. I confessed it. I could see myself flying and landing at these airports. Yeah. Yeah. And it took a while. It took a little bit of time. But as I continued to call that airplane in, I called it in, called it, even though I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. Then I remember we had a meeting in California. A man came up to me and gave me a check for several thousand dollars. And it came, and we took that and got that airplane, and then I w ended up doing the very thing I had seen myself doing. I had that image, I believed it, and I called it, and, and it when happened. When you saw that airplane land at that airport, you knew that was your airplane, and I knew it too. Yeah, I that's mean, right. it, it was just uh, before the thing ever landed, that's it. Yes. And uh, I can, the airplane I'm flying now, uh, uh, I can remember when it was nothing but a confession. <laughs> it was just a confession, words spoken, and all the possibilities out there, but uh, you had to believe and doubt not in your heart. You, you, it changes things, changes right. situation. You, you, you actually live it, you see it, you feel it, you, you breathe it, you say it before it actually happens.
I think one of the problems that people uh, have in understanding this, they don't realize sometimes that this is a way of life. It's not a fad. It's not something you do to just get out of a certain situation. It is a lifestyle of uh, speaking things in agreement with the Word of God, uh, staying in line with the laws of God, uh, the law of faith, the law of calling things that are not. This principle is, is one of the greatest principles in the Bible. And, and, and some people have never noticed it. I know I studied the Bible for years and never did see it until uh, uh, I started studying it from that angle. Jesus operated in this principle of calling things that are not in all of his ministry. But yet, if you don't study from that angle, you know, he, he, they woke him up and told him, we're all going to drown in this storm. He looked out at that storm and said, peace. <laughs> there wasn't any. He called it. Right. And, and that's what the Scripture says. God chose things that are not to bring to naught things that are. The storm was there. Peace wasn't there, but he called it. Called the peace. And it came. And then he looked down at the waves and said, be still. But they were still, but then they were. So the possibility was there, but what he said caused the manifestation of the thing desired. He called it. He called what he wanted. And that's where a lot of people make a mistake. They call what they don't want.